Great. Well, thank you. Um, certainly interesting to hear stories. And as you were going through it, Michael, I just sort of had flashbacks to, to failure moments that we had uh, at SolidWorks and also at CloudSwitch. Uh, let me give you a little bit of a, a background of who I am, and I'll make sure I give enough time to, to answer questions at the end. Uh, I'm currently uh, CEO of a new company called Belmont Technology. Uh, I assure you that will not be the name of the company when we release uh, the product and we go to market. Uh, but let me take a step back in time and tell you kind of the evolution of what's happened in my career and what I'm doing now. But uh, to do that, I'll go back. My, my training, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. I have been in the design space uh, and software world for, well, way too many years. <laughs> I won't give you the exact number, but way too many years. And it started back as a mechanical engineer at the University of Rochester. And you'll probably be able to do the math. It was 1983. I worked in the uh, laboratory for laser energetics, which was a nuclear fusion lab. And I had a summer job. And I was doing mechanical design. And the guy I was working for, this guy Frank DeWitt, realized I was far better at computers than I was design. And at that time, PCs had just come out. And so here I was using mechanical drafting board. He understood that I knew a little bit about computers. And he said, why don't you help us find a CAD system? So I had to go out and sort of learn about what CAD systems were out there. And it turns out AutoCAD was just starting. And there was a bunch of, of new software startups. Anyway, helped him uh, select a CAD system. And at the same time, we had a lot of drawings. And at that time, I don't know if people have ever heard of a company called DBase. And we ended up basically building a, a, a database system for drawings. And so here I am 30 plus years later helping people build slash select CAD systems and also helping them find engineering information. Why? Because the pain, as Michael talked about before, is still pretty significant. So fast forward, uh, I joined a company called SolidWorks. SolidWorks, how many people have ever heard of SolidWorks? OK, it's a 3D CAD company uh, based in Waltham now. Today, it's about a $600 million company. I joined it when we had our first sale of software. So the product had just started to come to market and, uh, and joined the company and, and had a bunch of roles there. Uh, like most good startups, uh, for those that are either thinking of joining a, a startup or are joining a startup, um, you know, you want a, good, a lot of good utility players early on. So I had a bunch of roles in marketing sales, building the partner development uh, platform, the, the partner uh, uh, application area. And uh, we were ultimately acquired by Dassault Systems. And we ran it as a separate company. And I was the CEO there uh, from about $100 million to roughly about $400 million company. And then took some time off. And then joined a company called CloudSwitch, which was an enterprise software company focused on helping people take their data center and extending it to the cloud. Uh, and that company, uh, we went through a lot of the similar pain points um, uh, that we heard about earlier. Uh, but ultimately, uh, realized that the sales model we had wasn't going to work. And we started building some strategic relationships, which ultimately led to a, a quite a successful outcome with Verizon, which now actually, they've almost tripled the size of the staff. And they've done a lot of great work with them. And in November, I hooked up with uh, with a bunch of the team from SolidWorks, which is kind of scary because we're a lot older and a little grayer. And, but uh, we sense an opportunity. And I won't go into too many specifics about the opportunity uh, of what we're specifically doing, but I'll, I'll characterize the, the, the essence of, of kind of the opportunity in front of us. And that is the world in which we live and how people design products is changing. Uh, people like my age and a little bit older are starting to retire, and, and younger generations coming in. So there's a demographic shift. And the demographic shift is one where guys my generation sort of go to the internet. Younger people live in the internet. And so they're in this hyper-connected world. And yet they come to companies that do design work. And they sort of see the CAD system in the corner. And it's this, this system that basically everything's locked down. And so we believe there's a shift happening in terms of, of how people work. We think there's a lot of market pressures. And, and, and the design process is changing. And we sense that how people build products is changing. The compute infrastructure has changed. The cloud is, is clearly having a huge impact in how and what people do. And we think there's a business model opportunity. So those four forces converging create an opportunity at Belmont. It's a company that got funded by Michael's uh, firm, as well as Commonwealth Ventures. And we raised $9 million in November. We started the company in November. And we raised $9 million. And then uh, just uh, April 1st, and it wasn't an April Fool's joke, uh, we ended up raising uh, $25 million in a, a preemptive Series B round. This gives us enough money to build our product and get to market and, and, and uh, hopefully along the way 
um, in case we do stub our toe, have enough capital to kind of see us through. And I tell you, that's one of the experiences that, uh, that having a little bit of a, of, uh, of a failure, and I'll call Cloud Switch, was a successful outcome, but one of the things we realized is that the market for cloud software was early when we started this. And we faced a situation where capital was going to be a big issue for us if we didn't change our model. And so with, with, uh, with Belmont, when the opportunity to raise more capital came in and it was at the right sort of terms, we, we decided to go ahead and do it. Enough about my background. Let's talk a little bit about what CAD is. If you look around us, all of the products in our lives, whether it was the coffee machine this morning that you used, whether it was a tablet that you picked up this morning, your phone, whether it was the, the car that you got in to turn the clock, you know, the, the radio in the car, whether it was these, these whiteboards, the projectors, the cameras, all of these things are products that are designed. So to understand the CAD world, you have to step back and realize this is a big market. Why is it a big market? Because all of these products have to be designed. So think about it. Somebody, somebody in the world figured out the size of glass and the type of glass to use here, but also what the length of these rails should be, how it should be assembled. So when you think about even just this simple example, there's an engineer somewhere in the world that built an engineering model, designed that, created specifications, sent it to a manufacturer who had to build that. So look around your world and you realize this is a big market. This is a market that today represents over $8 billion in terms of software in four companies alone. When you think about end user spend, it's probably north of $10 billion. And what are these companies doing? They're building software to help engineers make mistakes on the screen and not with the end product. And that's the key insight, is that allowing people to prototype in, in a digital format, it's far cheaper than to go ahead and build a product and actually create failure in the marketplace. So that's the market that we focused on early on at SolidWorks with some fundamental opportunities that we think were possible. So SolidWorks, 3D CAD system, let me give you a simple reason why SolidWorks existed. Have people heard of parametric technology, PTC? Okay, I'll do, do a quick step back. Lines and arcs, people did mechanical engineering design with lines and arcs. Autodesk translated that, lines and arcs from drawing boards, into the computer. You had large companies that were doing on mainframes and mini computers. AutoCAD did that same functionality, but did it on a laptop. What people really would love to do, though, is not just put lines and arcs on the screen. They wanted to be able to see things in 3D. For young people like you, you can't imagine a world that wasn't 3D. But trust me, not too long ago, everything was done in 2D. So big companies like Computer Vision came around, and they allowed you to build 3D solid models. The biggest benefit of that was understanding how things fit together and making sure that things didn't interfere with each other. And car companies, airplane manufacturers, would spend millions, tens of millions of dollars for these systems. The problem was, if somebody designed a car, and some, the, the, the design team designed it, everybody loved it, and they came in and they said, that's great, but, but make it a little kind of wider here and a little bit longer. The guys in the white lab coats had to go back in, redesign it, and four, five, six months later, they come out with the design. PTC did something phenomenal. There was a, a brilliant, brilliant guy by the name of, of Sam Geisberg, allowed these solid models to change. And this idea that you can make changes quickly and be able to see it iterate, much like a spreadsheet. That allowed engineers to be able to have rapid design changes. That was value. And they had incredible success because what their value proposition was, we all know you love 3D solid models because you can see how things go together. The problem is you can't make changes. They allowed people to make changes. And they ate a fortune. They built an amazing enterprise. They had an amazing sales team and they had great technology. And so when we were starting SolidWorks in the early days, people said, Nobody needs another solid modeler. PTC owns the market. The problem was the following. There was a ton of people that had their noses up against the glass. They wanted what PTC had, but they couldn't afford it. It was too expensive. It was too hard to learn, too hard to use. That was fundamentally the value that we created at SolidWorks. And today, it's a $600 million company. 
The question, and, and extremely profitable, generating close to almost a quarter of a billion dollars in profit each year. So the question is, how do you go? I mean, we knew there was opportunity. The question is, how do we go and capitalize on that opportunity? And I want to show four numbers. One, five, zero, three. There were many reasons why SolidWorks was successful, but I think fundamentally, this is one of them. Anybody know what it is? <laughs> if you go to SolidWorks today and ask anybody, it's, it's part of the culture. It's part of the DNA of the company. So I'm not going to go through a lot of hypothetical examples. I'm going to go through specifically how this impacted the company. I remember our first sales meeting. We were going to sell our software. Instead of $20,000, $30,000 through a direct sales force, we were going to sell our th software at $4,000, and we were going to sell it through a VAR, value-added reseller channel, meaning independent people that would represent our product, they'd get it at a discount and sell it. So the question is, when we got all these salespeople together for the first time, these are different independent business people, maybe 250 people, came to Waltham, Massachusetts. We had a meeting. And we had to tell them, where should they go selling? Where to go focus? Because they thought our product was great. And we put this chart up. I didn't put the numbers there the first time, but guess what? If you look at the vertical axis, this is the number of seats. This is the number of engineers that we wanted people to sort of look at and focus when they're going out and trying to sell the product. And this is the sales cycle. And most of the people who were independent business people, they wanted to go and sell 20, 30 seats, 40 seats. I remember a guy coming to me from Detroit saying, I have a really good friend inside of Ford. He runs Powertrain. And I know we can work with their data. I want to go sell them. Would you come out and visit with him? And I said, I hope you don't mind, while you're selling at Ford, if we had two other resellers in your backyard to go focus on the opportunities that you're not going to be focusing on. He wanted that upper left quadrant. Big opportunity. Well, guess what happens with the guy at Ford? They bring him in and they love it. People want validation. They love it. This guy's selling saying, this is awesome. The guy at Ford wants to buy our product. So he spends a little bit more time showing it to him. And the guy inside of Ford and Powertrain says, you know what? Our guys love it. The guys actually in styling, they want to see it as well. So can you come back next week and show them the product again? And all of a sudden, the sales cycle, instead of two months and three months, starts being four, five, six months. And the guys are like, well, we've got to get some business closed. They said, the good news is people really, really love it. And you know what we want to do? We want to do a pilot. We want to go ahead and buy your product. But instead of buying 60 seats, guess what? They ended up buying three. So what we wanted people to focus on is one to five seats, zero to three months. And that became known inside of SolidWorks as 1503, a 1503 account. Why was that so important? Because as that guy was selling, thinking he's going after 60 seat opportunity, if this is time, and this is real, this is losing money, this is making money, and these guys are massively sort of undercapitalized, they're out there selling, 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 thinking they're going to get this big deal, gets extended out, gets extended out, and what ends up happening? They get business, they get the PO, but it's for three, four, five seats, and they're losing money. And these are guys that can barely afford to make payroll. We wanted them, quick hits, get out. It served our strategic interest to get into a lot of accounts. Yeah? A lot of sales guys use expected values. From an expected value perspective, that would make sense because it's a big deal. And so did you take that into account? Sure. Most of these sales guys, most of those people who are thinking about expected value, they're probably sales guys that are making, what, 150, 200 grand a year? These sales guys were VARs. Their salespeople were probably making 65, 70 grand a year. We needed people to go out there and get quick hits, get into the account, and, and the most important thing was actually qualifying out accounts. So we didn't go for big strategic selling. We wanted to be like weeds popping up through the concrete. In fact, we tried to think, I was talking to John Hershtick, who was a founder of SolidWorks just the other day, and he's with us at, at, at Belmont. We were talking about it, kind of what was the perfect opportunity? And one of the perfect opportunities was not a 10-seat deal that had Pro Engineer. Remember, these are people with their noses stuck up against the, the glass door, wanting what, what was inside, but they couldn't afford it. 
So it was not to go to an account that had 10 seats of Pro-E and saying, let's go ahead and, and, and try and convince them to convert and switch over to us. Conversely, we didn't want them to go to 10 seats of 2D users, AutoCAD users, and try and have them all switch to SOLIDWORKS because we would have had to go through and teach them all about 3D solid modeling, go through this long sales process, only to have them buy one or two seats. We called it the modeling saturation index, a really kind of nice, nice term. And what it was, was we wanted them to have two or three seats of Pro-E that were exposed to 3D, but had eight seats of AutoCAD, because they already knew the benefits of 3D by having those two seats there, but we wanted them to get the advantage. Why didn't they have the other seats, eight seats, move to 3D? Well, probably because it was too hard to learn, too hard to use, and too expensive. Yeah? Um, this, this might be a question out of ignorance, but in thinking about sales cycles and thinking about the more impactful sales versus the little to at, at, at volume, why wouldn't you have affiliate marketing channels or web channels selling this as opposed to people that you have to spend time and money on training? And likewise, how much of this was business development versus sales? Like this almost sounds like an exploration in what is, what is the model of the sales versus order taking? Great. So the first question is why didn't we have affiliate marketing and web-based sales? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, contrary to what Al Gore said about the internet, I mean, <laughs> it is didn't it okay? exist. No, no, it didn't exist. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm being, being a little cute here. I mean, in fact, when we started SolidWorks, we were having a decision about, and I know this is going to be in the way back time machine, but we had a debate, and I remember it being in the, in the order room, kind of the, the shipping room. We had, we had a debate whether or not we should have a website. And I know you can laugh, but we said, what would we put on the website? We said, well, we could put our address, directions, maybe some marketing materials. And then we all laughed because they said, you know, someday maybe people will download updates for our software, and we all cracked up laughing. And you know what? We were one of the first 100,000 websites registered in the world. Okay? Now, why, why, would, why wouldn't you use affiliate marketing? Of course you'd use that today. But we had VARs. These are value-added resellers. These are businesses, independent businesses, that were selling other products already, selling consulting services, selling training. We needed these people, one, to survive. They didn't have a lot of capital. But two, they wanted to go out and expand their customer base. And we wanted them too. It was critical for us to go through and get customers to try the product, use the product, get successful with the product, because we knew there would be viral adoption once people started using it. It would draw other customers into this, into this solution. Yeah? Uh, I was wondering, how do you figure out for a different business, what is your 1503? Well, we were lucky early on that we kind of got it right, but we knew, that we, we knew there was a tendency. The good news is we knew there was a tendency that people wanted to pull us up into higher accounts and larger accounts. And we knew with our sales channel that we had and our price point, we couldn't afford to have a direct sales force going out and selling $4,000 software. So we knew we had to go through a VAR channel. That was part of our business model early on. And we knew that they would be attracted to try and go after the bigger accounts. So we had to intentionally force them to go smaller. One, because quite frankly, they weren't hiring the top talent that we needed. So we had, there was an impedance match that we had to have with their skill set, their presence, and, and, and our ability to kind of message to them. So we had to keep it incredibly, incredibly simple. So it was just simply about kind of focus and, and re repetition of message. Does that make sense? Um, so the benefits of this model, incredible predictability in terms of, of revenue stream. The question was, could we scale this? That was a big question. I, I just noticed Rich was back there and he probably remembers the first board meeting. We had our revenue plan our first year, I think it was 3.8 million, we kind of upped it to, to $4 million and, and we had no idea what we were gonna do. And we ended up doing something like 12.8 I think in the first year. But it was all about sort of scaling and keeping focus and, and having a repeatable process. Now how did we know early on? We didn't. But we spent a lot of time with customers and with VARs in the early message. There was a lot of four-legged sales calls our regional people going out with the VARs and doing sales calls to understand what the objections were. But it was all about kind of basically getting customers to adopt the product, get into production, and we knew that once they got into production, they'd start shipping files around that would create the viral nature of people trying to understand what our business was about. To give you an example about why this is important and about scaling a company, I just want to share one, one, one point. We started growing the company, and 1503 was all about the predictability of revenue stream. Well, it turns out, that this is a philosophy. We had to be able to take an order inside of the company, be able to process the order, get the product, ship it out to a customer, and be profitable, be profitable 
with, with, at, at a $2,400 price net margin to us. Going a little bit further, when we scale this up and we had to do an upgrade cycle, we were shipping out boxes. These boxes had to be shipped and they weighed 15.9 ounces. Why? Because it's 16 ounces UPS charged higher freight weight. So this became a cultural mentality inside of the company in terms of execution. And the strategy was simple. Get inside of the account, land and expand. That's how we built the business. Did, this, did that mean we only went after small, small companies? No. As we grew and we grew the account base, we ended up getting to some significant accounts. I remember being on a panel with the CIO from EMC about selling to large accounts. I'm like, why the hell am I here? We, we, we never called on EMC at the high level. We ended up displacing Pro Engineer at EMC, you know, several hundred seats. Why? We did it three, four seats at a time. And once we got to about 50, 100 seats, they had to deal with us. So that was our strategy. Let me just turn about some other practical things. We had an ecosystem inside of SolidWorks. Michael talked about it before, in terms of whole product and core. One of the things we understood early on at SolidWorks is we were going to focus on core modeling. And we were going to have partners do the rest. But we had to build a partner system to build applications on, time, on, time, on top of SolidWorks. How did we do it? Well, first thing you got to realize is partners are interested in only one thing, your customers. But how do you get customers if you don't have any partner applications on top of it? We proposed a simple three-step process. First was this idea of kind of marketing cold fusion. It was all about getting credibility through numbers. How do we you know, create press releases, relationships? We had a very lightweight program early on about quote unquote what a partner meant. Step two was about focusing on a few select partners in each vertical market. And in this case, we went through and we wanted to create some leaders. In the analysis world, there was a bunch of big vendors. They wouldn't give us the time of day. We chose the number three vendor and we said, we're going to make them number one in our space. So we went to each segment and picked a vendor and just through sheer force and kind of bear hugging them, we got them to build integrated applications. And once they started to get mind share in our channel and we got credibility and they started getting sales, the big guys had to follow. So leaders, you know, first was marketing cold fusion, leaders set the pace, and the third was that followers will follow. And the irony here is this that the followers were actually the leaders in each of these categories. So yeah. who owned the IP for the They did. We were a platform. We were a platform that they built on top of. I just want to share another kind of couple of thoughts that I know we're running late, late on time here. Meet your enemy. You're in a startup. The only advantage, the only advantage you have is time. That's the only advantage you have. You may have a clever idea. You may have some IP. But the install base guys have customers, they have capital, they have presence, they have a megaphone. The only thing you have is the calendar. You've got to be able to move quickly. So I have a saying, and it's something that I think is a cultural one, I would share with you, events force actions. What did everybody do yesterday? Pay their taxes, right? Was that yesterday? <laughs> Why did you do that? Because if you don't, the government makes it really painful. They created that event on April 15th to make sure you paid your taxes. So events force actions. Find ways inside of your company to go ahead and put deadlines. We used to have SolidWorks World. We'd have 5,000 people come to an event. We'd do it once a year. And it costs us roughly $2 million inside of the company. And forget the fact that the benefit was we'd got these, you know, all the users together and they'd be these shaved head zealots that would go out and tell everybody about us afterwards and create all the energy. If you strip all that away and forget all the media exposure, if the only benefit that we got out of spending that $2 million as the company was growing was to get people together on one day and force decisions, it was hugely worth it because it forced people to align and make decisions. So this idea of putting deadlines and events is critical because it's reinforcing the only advantage that you have. The other point about this is we have a saying, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Early on, you just got to get your product done, get it out there, and iterate. I'll share a couple other thoughts, what you think versus what you know. Everybody tells you to beta test, beta test, beta test. Really, really important. Far more important. If people aren't paying you for something, they'll tell you all day. We saw it at CloudSwitch. A ton of people loved it. A ton of people loved it. How many people would pay for it? And when they ended up paying for it, we ended up realizing they were paying for something very different. They were not paying for the product.
they were paying for education. I'll share a couple, couple quick thoughts. We had a subscription service program inside of SOLIDWORKS. Today, it's a $300 million business. I just want to share some insight about how we decided what to charge. How do you decide to price your product? You can figure out you can build it on what it costs, or you can figure out what the market's willing to pay for it. Okay. It, sound, it sounds like you could bear a $2,400 price point on the other side. So it sounds like, like $600 per. So we went out and saw what, other com what the competitors were charging, the install base. Up until the point when we started SOLIDWORKS, there was no idea of subscription-based revenue. It was a shrink wrap model. And the, the large install base guys were charging list price and 18%. So that was kind of what the market was used to. So we went out and sort of said, OK, we know that we're going to charge at least 18%. We have a lower price point. So the question is, what will we charge? And we thought about different price points. And then we also sort of looked at it and said, wait, we have to align not just what our interests are in terms of what it costs, but also our VARs. Because we wanted our VARs to be able to go and support customers. So we had to align what their support model was along with what we wanted to make. So we went and started from the premise of what would a customer pay? From a VAR perspective, how many people could they support? So we looked at the VAR profitability equation, that, that internal sort of step between us and the customer. Because we needed them to make customers successful. So we ended up saying, OK, they can handle this many customers in terms of calls. This is how many customers times whatever money. How much money do they need to make, and what would be our margin? So we started actually at the end user, worked to the middle, worked back to the end user, and came back. Point, point is, it's not just about the money you want to receive. You've got to align each step in the process. I'll just share some other thoughts. We all talked about turning products into companies. I love this saying. It's easy to start a company. It's hard to build a business. At the end of the day, you are trying to build a company, but you're really trying to build a business. Events force actions. The perfect is the enemy of the good. One of the things that I think at SolidWorks today, I don't know, they have 1,000, 1,100 people inside of there. We have a small company. We have 17, 18 people. But we're starting with the same mantra, that the most important thing you can do is hire well. I think that's an incredibly important thing. Hire people that scare you with their competence. Salespeople, a couple insights. If you have a salesperson that says they don't really care about money, they're not a good salesperson. Fire them. <laughs> I'm dead serious. Salespeople work on two, two components. Reach behind their back and look for the coin slot. They are coin operated. And if they're not, you are not going to be able to put the right incentives in place. Salespeople are motivated by money. If they're not, they're not good salespeople. They may be great people and they may be great marketing people, but if they're not motivated by money, they are not good salespeople. The other thing that motivates salespeople is recognition. If you've got a salesperson that is not concerned about how they stack up and rank versus other salespeople in your company, get rid of them. Salespeople are naturally aggressive and they're, and they're competitive. They want to make money and they're competitive. Those are the two drivers in salespeople. That's not to say they wouldn't be valuable for your company, but they're not going to be great salespeople. As CEOs or founders, the other thing that you're doing is you're creating a culture. I talked about 1503 as a strategy. It was about a culture. We had created a culture that every step in the way, we were going to make money in terms of being able to be efficient. We also cared about customers that we didn't know the names of. That was a cultural thing. We built a company on the backs of companies that we never even knew the names on a broad basis. They're not companies that you would look at and have billboards and have logos and say, you know, Nike's using our product. Most of the people were suppliers to Nike's or mold shops. We were damn proud of what they did, and we felt great about what those customers did, and we celebrated their successes. But the point is, we aligned the company consistently in terms of product pricing, product packaging, and, and, and culture throughout. Um, fundamentally, the last part I'd say is with all of the challenges, and I won't bore you with the cloud switch ones, we ran into some, some difficult times. But remember, uh, it really is about the journey. That's why most entrepreneurs do it. Most entrepreneurs start companies because they see the world and how the world should be. So as you're going through that journey, understand that, yes, while success is great and money's great, the journey's also part of what's fun. With that, I'll open up for any questions you may have. So, I mean, one of the things that you did there, which I, I know is, you know, literally 
part of the legacy you left at, at SolidWorks is you very early on established this culture of having a clear and consistent way that the product was sold, that was profitable, and you even created a disruptive business model, this whole subscription uh, plan, which many of you have heard me talk about. That in fact, I would say, if you'd agree, the subscription model was as important in many ways uh, in your success as anything else. It was game changing. So as the team looks at looking around this room is, is thinking about starting up a company now, and you're, you're doing it yourself right now, what would be the one or two things you'd say, think about right up front in your product that will make a difference to enable profitable selling and a culture that is successful? So, great, great question. So one of the things that we, we learned really, I'd say by chance, um, we tried to figure out with our customer base, you know, what version of the software. So we weren't a SaaS based application, people had to install our software. And so one of the challenges we had, I mean, up until we started, software companies didn't actually, when, when they went through distribution, they didn't necessarily know who their end user was. So by having a subscription service, we sold through VARs, but we demanded up front to know who the user was. Once we did that, we at least had a relationship with, the, with those customers. But we didn't necessarily know what version people were on, and so we had this tool that we called a performance monitoring tool very early on. And it was a little bit, kind of like a little nugget of software that was on, 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 on their PC. It would send back aggregate data. We would only look at it in aggregate. And we could see what version people were on. And we could also see what different add-ins they had. So this idea of, 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 of analytics and measuring, we did it to solve a problem. It turns out it was a huge enabler for a business decision later on. So I'd like to say we designed it in the, in the beginning, but it, it was something we introduced kind of three versions into the product. But let me give you an example of what it did. Since we could figure out what version people were on, we also knew which applications they were using along with SolidWorks. And what we found is if you took the number of customers and on the y-axis and the number of applications that they were using on the x-axis, it was a massive ski slope. Meaning not many people were using more than two applications with SolidWorks and we could figure out which were the most popular applications. And these weren't ones that we wrote ourselves. These were partner applications. So we had this really long tail of people not having many applications. They would try one different application or whatever else. So we had the opportunity, once we looked at that, we were fighting a price war with Autodesk. Autodesk had AutoCAD 2D, and they bundled their 3D solution, and they were undercutting us on price. And we realized that all the value of these applications were not being used by customers. And so we went out and started to find out why. Well, it turns out many of the VARs that were trying to sell these applications, it kind of wasn't worth their hassle to go back to a customer and sell a four or $500 application. What we said then is, okay, are there groups of these products that we can bundle together, you know, kind of use the oldest trick in the book, why? Because it worked. And we said, can we bundle and create SolidWorks, SolidWorks Office Professional and Office Premium? And we took these other applications that weren't really being used by people, we bundled them together, and in the middle of a price war with Autodesk, we took our price point from $4,000 for our base product to $5,400 to $7,500. And along the way, increased the subscription. So we created greater value for the end user, greater value for VARs, and greater value for SolidWorks. And for those application partners, yes, on the marginal seat that they might have sold of a photo rendering product, they weren't going to get as much money. But I went back to each of them and said, look, you're only making 15 grand, 20 grand from us. How about if you give me a blanket license, we'll pay you 100 grand. And I went to a bunch of different technology suppliers and we bundled all those together. And we raised our ASP by over 50% in the middle of a price war with our biggest competitor and we grew our volume, pro, you know, commensurate. I mean, it was tremendous. You would normally think by raising your price in a price war, we'd see diminished volumes. We actually grew it tremendously. So, it cre and once we did that, when new entrants came in, we had a higher subscription revenue base. So it was defensible. So when people came in with other products and wanted to get our VAR channel to join them and take, take their product on, there were some VARs owners, these are small businesses that were waking up on January 1st and they had a subscription business of a million and a half to two million dollars. They weren't gonna go to a competitor. So we built in kind of a, a, a barrier for people stealing our channel. And that all came about by accident in terms of analytics. So the idea of understanding early on what's happening can pay huge dividends later on. 
I'd like to say we had the genius to figure it out early. We didn't, but we soon capitalized on it. Yeah. Uh, so you kind of touched on this, but I'm curious, which did you find more valuable, both in the early stage and as you grew, the data behind the product or the product itself? Great question. The data behind the product or the product itself. So the product itself was an amazing product. Let's be really clear. The team built an amazing product and it only got better. The question we tried to do is we had many people were using this product and they were building, for example, pneumatic cylinders. Okay, Festo is a large German conglomerate that builds pneumatic cylinders. You go through a factory, you can hear all the, you know, these are all things that are cylinders moving things down a factory line. So Festo used SolidWorks. And so we had this great idea, you know, all these people that are building bearings, that are building motors, that are building fasteners, can we take that and, and create a business of either selling content, so we created a website to allow people to download content in 3D and use it, and we went off then and said, can we create a publishing solution? Because all of these manufacturers that made bearings and motors and everything else had to create catalogs, and they were creating paper catalogs. And we said, look, you're using SolidWorks already, why don't you go and create a 3D electronic catalog? So we built a whole business around doing that. And guess what? We failed miserably. You know why? why? One simple thing. We thought, because we know Festo, and we had relationships with the engineering team, we thought we had a relationship with that customer. And here's where, if we had done something fundamentally different, we could have been successful in it. I thought, and I'll take responsibility for it, I thought we have a relationship with that customer. Why can't our team go and sell to the marketing team inside of that company? Guess what? I should have treated it as a completely separate company. Because it turns out the engineering people didn't even know the marketing people in these companies. And oh, by the way, I shouldn't have used our sales team. I should have gone out and hired media salespeople to go after that opportunity. So it was, whether it was you know, kind of just Arrogance? I don't know. I thought we had a relationship with that customer and I thought that would transfer over into the marketing department because they had the data. Flawed assumption. And we, after three years, you know, of spending a lot of money and a lot of time, we kind of finally realized that and, and made a little bit of a business of it, but it was a real, you know, um, even insight. Know, even knowing that, do you, is then the answer that the data is not as valuable as the product? Or is it that the data is only as valuable as you leverage it? We tried to leverage it and we did a poor job of it. I still think the value, I think that the data, um, I think fundamentally the data could have been far more valuable than we, than we were able to take advantage of it. But no, the business, let's be clear, the business was building CAD software and support. That's, you know, that's where 600 million, you know, billions of dollars of end user and billions of dollars of market value was created by solving a design problem. The content I think could have been used far more strategically and we, we screwed up on it. So just because of time, I'm going to give everybody a chance to chat with John afterwards, but I want to wrap up. Um, I want to say thank you very much, John. That was just outstanding. Um,